This is episode 186 of the Super League Pod. Find out what law firm we think should sit on the bench for England in Denver, get stats on all the England players ahead of the game in Denver, then hear our predictions for the game in Denver, plus loads of other news and your views on a thrilling state of mind round in Super League. Strap yourselves in, kids. It's your favourite podcast, the Super League Pod. Hello everyone, welcome along to episode 186 of the Super League pod. Mark here, your regular host, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined again this week by Tim G, uh, Hull KR, uh, a fan and Coventry Bears ground announcer. How are you doing, Tim? Yeah, I'm, I'm alright, yeah, I had a good uh, good couple of weeks, it's been interesting uh, doing mixed different things, and then uh, yeah, went to the cricket last Wednesday, which was good fun, at the, at the Oval. Uh, do you so know it's the what? one day against the Australians. I, the the one day is have completely bypassed me, so I'm not sure what I've been doing, but I've uh, forgotten that they were even on until this afternoon when I saw something on on the news about Stokes and um, someone else Wokes being out of the next few games, <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, oh shit, that series has started. All right, okay, so there you go. Um, I've uh, it was quite fun because they were handing out little yellow. There's a sponsor that was handing out little yellow squares of sandpaper with four and six on. <laughs> so it's quite fun. We were sat there with, like, but the um, stewards were confiscating them off some people, but not others. That's so it just depended strange. which which steward you got. Oh, depended okay. on if you got confiscated or if he just didn't care and waved it through. But who, um, who was it, handing the, those out? Which which sponsor? I think they were called Dabble. I don't know. There's some sort of stock market related. Oh, right. Thing. but the funny thing was is you forgot that you were ha- you were having sandpaper every time you were bringing them up so you bring them out your pocket and then go why is my hand hurting <laughs> oh yeah it's because i've got a giant piece of sandpaper in my pocket <laughs> well obviously if you're a professional cricketer it wouldn't hurt you would you you'd just be able to no. cope with that problem um yeah i've been um do you know what i've been doing obviously i've been doing stuff it was uh it was you went, you went for a, an east yorkshire adventure this weekend yeah, well, it was Emma's birthday and degree show as well, weren't it, last week? So lots of things with Emma during the middle of the week last week. And then... How did, how did the show go? Well, she won an award. Um, very proud of her for that. She she She's excellent. She's, she's sat in the room, so she's uh, looking up now that I'm talking about her. Um, she won an award for basically... Was it best in show? Yeah, best as ga- best design scheme in in part two at the Grenfell Baines Institute of Architecture at UCLan. So that's that's what she won. So I'm very proud of her. But her name came up on a big screen, and she got got presented with an award, and she won a prize for that. And um, her work was definitely the the best of the work on display. I, I would say, um, although uh, there's some bias in that. Um, it doesn't. I, I do believe that she she's her work was above the others on display um so that's very good and i was very proud of it and then yeah we went to hull for the weekend well for saturday night and uh do you know what it's city center's not that bad is it it's quite nice it's all tied up nowadays yeah it's all, it's all pretty back very when gentrified. i was there yeah when i was there as a student it was um not quite as fun we still had the bus station um, and events, which is now, well, it's where the bus station and the shopping centre are now. Ah, but it used okay. to be a sort of big concrete monstrosity that was just sort of barely holding itself together. And you're is that always the sort of half. Is that the, is that the um, shopping centre by the train station? Yeah. It's very nice, so that's, that shopping centre. I only walked through it, like, on the way back from the ground, really. That's my only experience of it, but it was very nice. Yeah. Lots of, lots of uh, new hotels gone up around there as well, which is a very, very yeah. nice area. I mean, you don't um, have to get far out of the out of the city centre to understand why Hull's got a bit of a reputation but um, but the city centre was fantastic I couldn't recommend enough going there and, and visiting I mean after like late late hours there was a few tacky bars but hey you know I, I live only a few miles from Blackpool so I fully understand a tacky bar <laughs> couple, a couple of nice places down by the uh, the water as well there's a nice little cocktail bar that's quite new Steinbeck and Shaw been there a couple of times when I've been over that's been uh that's been a highlight, if nothing else, just for the prices, because you used to sort of 
down south prices you go up there and say oh hello this is this is suddenly cheap well there was a few places that were selling like craft beers and that at, at four pounds plus a pint so you know it's it's they, those prices have caught up around the country now haven't they it's uh certainly it's creeping up yeah I, but it, i don't get this is something i'm struggling to understand like cask is still a lot cheaper than craft when they throw the different word in front of it but it's essentially the same product production costs are going to be that much more for these in fact if anything the storage and the distribution costs will be less for that type of beer um i would have thought so it's it's a confusing one why they're about a pound a pound 20 more on a pint um but there you go that's how the market's moved i suppose but um yeah uh and got to meet um up with some of the hull fans from the slp family people like uh, sarah and all her family were at the game um who, sarah who occasionally co-hosts the show as well so it was great to meet her husband and um a couple of her kids that that aren't joshua that because you know we talk a lot about joshua but um sarah's the rest of the sarah's family so that was great to spend some time with them and meet all of those um the nadins were in town for the game were they, were they on the always. way on this on the fruity ciders uh, yeah, and obviously with the the fruity hair colours and beard colours as well to to go <laughs> along with that, and uh, got to meet Langers, um, who I'm sure we'll have a match review on from that game for the first time. So Langers is someone who supported the show really well over the last few years, so it was really great to meet him. What what an absolute gent he was. Met a couple of people from his family, his mum and his brother-in-law um, as well. So uh, that was great, and got to hang out a bit with sean from the wigan fan tv show that you'll occasionally see me pop up on if you're if you're across things on social media like that so uh all all in all it was a good time in hull um and we'll get to the the game later on but uh it's probably time that we touch on some more goings on before we get to the weekend action so we're going to go through some of what's gone on in the last week but some of the some of the busyness that's been going on on around the, the game and the the structure and all of that sort of stuff we're just going to cover off quickly up front in this feedback section then we're going to cover off some bits of news that largely centered around contract re-signings although we'll start that with the new zealand squad so there'll be a very very um heavy reference to and return to the denver international game throughout the throughout the show we're going to focus on the super league games and your fan reviews we have fan reviews from every one of those six games and then after that we are going to look forward to that denver test and origin too so it's going to be lots of mentions of denver uh, in this show in this show so if you're playing a drinking game um, based on mentions of denver then you're going to get very hammered fair enough um right so i mean obviously like i said tim the we're just going to fly fly over the goings on in the uh the, the well officially nothing officially that, nothing's but, happened so <laughs> exactly um, all that's happened is a lot of chairmen have released a lot of statements lots of statements um, and and you know on a on a <laughs> most, I'd like, I'd, mostly for I mean, the... here's a stat for you to do for next week is how many chairmen are yet to release an official statement <laughs> well i've been trying to keep on top of all of them but um because a lot think, of them are so similar I think, was it in the bat, content the and tone, league? it's hard to discern the differences between them, isn't it? <laughs> I think the bat, I think the Batley one wins though, just for sheer brilliance. This means war. It was definitely someone who who'd had a few, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably someone was it like by a pool somewhere on an all-inclusive <laughs> holiday, and just thought, let's bag this statement out. And I think they've pulled it back down off the website, didn't they? Uh, but the, but the. Uh, the humour was done at that stage. No, but we've got... Uh, I did a show with Gareth Walker, the rugby league journalist from the Mirror and also contributor to League Express and Rugby League World, Gareth Walker, um, during the week last week. So you should go back and listen to that. Uh, it's SLP short number four. You can hear us cover all of that from Robert Elston's first public appearance as the Super League CEO. Um, Alan Cale, who's the other regular co-host alongside Tim and Sarah, wrote a blog post that you'll be able to see up at superleaguepod.com. He wrote sort of... Uh, a look back at the Super 8s scene as it seems like they're on the way out with um, Gary Hevington and a few championship clubs the, the main stumbling block to getting that pushed through from what the majority of the Super League clubs are, are looking for as a change in the structure um, so go over there and read that I mean I don't want to jump through all of that and, and not give you a say on things Tim so do you have anything you you want to you know make out from what's been going on or are you yeah I mean I, I sort of I came up with my own plan um during the week which was okay if, if we're gonna we, we say we want to 
regular fixture list. And I think having a regular, more regular fixture list is better than the uncertainty of the Super 8. It certainly is, from my perspective, as someone who's, you know, working for a club, it's much easier to plan. It's much easier to plan my life this year when I've known when I'm doing everything up yeah. till September uh, rather than the last two years where I missed a game each year due to holiday just by virtue of no one, I didn't have any clue what was going on and I wasn't going to reserve every weekend between end of June and um, yeah, September. So it's it's easier. So fr- from that, I mean, my overriding thing, I still think in general we need to play less games. I think from both a marketing perspective, you know, you can really hype up each game. But if you think of things like the derbies in particular, when you're getting three, four, five in a season, it does detract from that. So I think having less games and making them each game more special is and make you know each one more of an event, hype it a bit more, have some breathing room for big fixtures as well. Have a you know a week before or after to to have some build up is never too bad a thing. If that allows you to squeeze in some more internationals as well, then that's got to be a good way to grow the game, especially if we've got uh, an England Knights program as well as the main England or Great Britain program. If you've got some more time in for that, that's a good thing. And one thing. I did think in terms of the specifics of promotion and relegation would be actually you have one, whoever wins the league goes up as of right. That's undeniable. You know, if they've won, they've won the championship. Fair enough. They go up and then you have some sort of playoffs final series between however many clubs you want to involve of the championship and the bottom. So many of super league. So that last spot is, you know a wavering spot so it might be that two up to come up in one year it might just be the one but it's up for them so it goes down to that million pound game it's which supposedly that, is, yeah. is 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 happy with, people are happy with we i'm personally not a massive a fan at of the whole um, about the mil- like having like a maybe a million pound series so that either it's you know top and bottom swap but then um the other couple either side have like a semi-finals and then a, a playoff final or even just you actually have the top two playoff in the championship for the grand final and the bottom two playoff for uh, playing in the relegation final then and they then the winner of the championship grand final would play against the loser of the sort of relegation game that my so so all so those sorts of ideas they're things that have got to be finalized and my that is the this is one of I don't want to get too bogged down with the structure stuff and Gareth, the talk about Gareth, we tried to move away from it as much as we could and cover the other stuff that Robert Elson had covered off and definitely read the the trade papers today because they've got some good coverage of that sort of stuff in them. But yeah, th- with this unbalanced fixture list as it is, you know, going to be, I don't mind how that affects the top of the league because we've got a playoff structure and a grand final. So that should really There's pick out, out any team quirks. over and- Again, if you're good enough, you should be able to come through that. Yeah, exactly. But you'd you'd probably, with an unbalanced fixture list then, need something for the other end of the table where it isn't just a straight swap. Um, Because because you could get an unfortunate run of fixtures, just how they fall. It it shouldn't be like that because you should be basing it on where people finish at the end of the season before and then having a balanced run through that. But, you know, it could just be that you end up with a team having a, a couple of teams maybe having poor seasons one year fitting into mid table positions. So say, you know, Wigan and Leeds were positions five and seven or something in every, and you played the odd teams as your six teams. If you finished in an even place, the team that finished 10th or the team that's newly promoted or something like that could face two of the top, two of the bigger clubs who yeah. might've just had an off season. And, and that would be, unfortunate but how the system works and i like that you know that's okay but i don't like it if one place is going to end up with a relegation spot off the back of it it's, it's, it makes me feel uncomfortable that i don't mind a playoff aspect to do that but not a a single a spot after the court spot after the course of the season so it's interesting that you raise that as well yeah i think i think there's a balance to be had and i and i do wonder how much is a this is definitely what the chairman want and how much is a this is our initial negotiating position and we'll row back from that into something where we actually want to end up later on well the sense clearly if is, if that there is there's 11 clubs that want to 
push through a change, those 11 clubs aren't necessarily unanimous on how they want that change to look. So